So today I'd like to talk about a project that we did earlier in the year and it was something that we started from scratch and uh, for a project that was a really tight deadline. So Chemist View is a company in the UK and we're an online pharmacy and we're about third in the UK in terms of size and yeah it's about 175 200,000 items a month that we're dispensing and we're doing uh, NHS and private prescriptions so there's the NHS side is, is quite a complicated beast in the UK um, and we also do B2B so healthcare partners and so this new partnership was formed and it was with this clinic which had been going for a few years doing ADHD diagnostic and treatment and so on and they already had a partnership um, but we were going to be the dispensing pharmacy because the existing pharmacy was couldn't um, scale it couldn't get enough of the medication and we're quite a large um, organization so we can get a lot of this medication and so the requirements for this some of it Seem, probably seems a bit obvious but obviously we need this kind of integration to receive the patient information and the prescription data and that's obviously got to be secure and what it means is that if you go to that clinic then they will send across the um, when they get prescribed they'll send across the medication to us and then we can dispense it now because it's coming to us and the at that point we actually if it's a private prescription especially we need to take the payment from that customer or if it's an NHS one that means we have to we have to do an invoice but we claim it back from the government basically now there's also this kind of workflow as you can imagine some of these drugs are actually um, like there's a lot of regulations around it so we have to have this workflow where we receive the script we do a load of checks we look at your health like your history um, and all of them have to be adhered to before we can actually post them out and dispense them. And also customer service are going to get calls about this. You know, it's a new integration, there's a new um, partner in partnership and so we have to be able to handle them, them queries that are coming through. And when we have gone through all the process, all the clinical checks, then we need it to send it to our existing warehouse fulfillment system, our ERP system, so that it can go through our automation and it can be posted out. But it needed to launch in eight weeks. And that was purely because the existing pharmacy that they were using was running out of this medication. So these patients wouldn't be able to get hold of the medication. And so they came to us and we said, okay, what's the closest deadline we can do without having crunch? And we decided that based on some of these technologies and, and our existing systems, we could do this in eight weeks. And that's what we set out to do and what we ended up doing. So because we've only got eight weeks, it's really important for us that we had to concentrate on the business logic. We don't want to be working on like, the infrastructure and spending a lot of time on infrastructure. We're not a, a huge team, so we don't have a full infrastructure team. We don't have like an existing Kubernetes or that kind of thing. We have to build something from scratch and we don't want to spend in that eight weeks building up all the, of the infrastructure for that. And so, hence why we went for serverless, which gives us that built-in high availability. We don't really need to think too much about it. And low administration from serverless, which when you're having to manage EC2s and you've not really got that team for it, 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 you know, it takes a lot of admin, where serverless, obviously, they take care of it for you, and so it makes it a lot easier. We also had to, obviously, rapidly develop for this. And serverless is really good for that, especially when you've got a bit of experience in it and you're doing infrastructure as code and so on. It allows you to build something really quickly and get that out, and then you can just iterate on that. And that auto scaling capability that you get with serverless, it, whilst we didn't need a huge auto scale, like we didn't, we weren't going to get like massive amounts of orders. We obviously are not going to get like many at night, but we'll get some in the day and so on. So we, you know, it gives us that auto scaling that we don't really need to think about, and it allows us to grow without really having to worry about where it's going to go and so on. So we started this with a prototype and it's, it's a prototype, not a proof of concept. And it's something that typically I'll do when I start a new project. So in this case, we use CDK uh, for our infrastructure as code, but we have previously used CloudFormation, we've got Terraform in places and so on. But CDK is something that we've settled on um, in the last few years, especially. And it allows us to get going really quickly because we've got that experience. 
Now our unit tests, we actually use Vitest for this, but we um, again wanted unit tests in that prototype from day one so that we could build really quickly. And it was the same with the static code like analysis. So um, instead of like pretty and stuff, we settled on biome. But we wanted to make sure that from day one, again, we've got that automated linting, the automated formatting. So we're not spending time during them eight weeks just getting stuck on QA and so on. And we wanted the fundamentals in this prototype of a hexagonal architecture. So that just really means that in our Lambda functions, we want to have the basics in place so we can ex extend that. And multiple uh, people can start working on that and start building in the different ports and adapters and so on that you get with a hexagonal architecture. So we can start off, because we're um, using things like CDK and so on, we can start off getting the boilerplate really quickly. It's another reason why CDK is actually really good for getting going. So if you just run the CLI tool, you'll get this boilerplate. And that's something you can actually then just build and deploy straight into the cloud and um, get, get going very, very quickly. And it's the same for the front end. You know, we've got a, a front end for this for customers. And so in this case, we use Vite, but we can use the, um, the boilerplate for that to give us what is effectively a full app and you know, combine them together and we can have something starting to deploy out really quickly. And so the basic CDK code can be put together where we just put that code from you know, the basic Vite project that we created, this React project. We can deploy that out using CloudFront, using really simple boilerplate. And at this point, we've got something that's fully working. So in that first day, so you know, I started on this in the morning, you know, in that full first day, we do end up with a basic authenticated website. And that's just because we're using boilerplate stuff. So you've got Cognito, you can just plug it into CDK and you will get something you can use for authentication. And then we can also use Amplify libraries in React to give us a full login registration and so on. So whilst it's a basic authenticated website, it just looks like the boilerplate. And that needs to hit a stubbed API, which again, with CDK, we can build up this API gateway and we're using these serverless services so we can have this um, full kind of seemingly end-to-end -end kind of project. We've got them unit tests in place. Again, it's just the boilerplate at this time, but we've got unit test capability. We've got the static code analysis, the code formatting in there. We've set up a basic CI CD pipeline, so we're running them on every build, or we're doing builds, tests, and so on. And we've got this capability of ephemeral environments. Because we're doing serverless, another great benefit is that each of our developers can just deploy that out to the same AWS account and have their, their own stack, basically, their own full website, backend, and so on. And so nobody's stepping on each of his toes. So from there, where'd you go? So the most complex area is, is the most logical place to start when you've got eight weeks. It's quite easy to start saying, oh, let's build the website because we can just get start doing the front end. But in this case, we really need to make sure that we get that integration sorted. Um, that's going to be the most complicated. So it's really important to define that interface as early as possible and deploy out this basic stubbed API. So it's not got any features behind it. It is just stubbed, but it's got the validation in place. And then we've got the shared environment and we can have a Swagger document off the back of that. And now this third party we're working with, they can start their development and they're developing against an API that isn't going to change. And we can just fill it in in the back end and they can do their work and it makes it that you can get, they can get going and we can get going really quickly. And so for this partner API, we've got a API gateway, a REST API in this case, and we use it one of stub responses, so we can do that in API Gateway. And we can use that built-in validation that's in API Gateway as well. And in that case, you build up a schema that looks something like this. And you know, it'll give you things like min lengths, max lengths, and sort of basic validation, required fields, and so on. And it's, again, it's really quickly to get that in there and start, start um, deploying that out and using it. The only downside if you do that is if you're posting to that, as an example, let's say you post customer name to that API, it will get rejected by the built-in validation, but you'll just get back this kind of invalid request body and a 400, which is, you know, it's really good. You've now got some sort of validation, but if you're doing an integration, if any of you have done this, you don't want that response. You need to know why it failed, because otherwise it's really, really hard. You'd have to start reading the Swagger doc and so on. 
And so what you can do is you can set this kind of um, what's called a bad request body in API Gateway where you can send back the validation error. In this case, just dump it out as a string. And what that means is that if somebody posts that endpoint, they now get back a, some sort of description which says why it's failing. So again, it's really important on this like first week of development, we want to get this up and running and we want them to be able to work on it without lots of complexity and trying to figure out why it's failing. But the downside with this is if you've got an example like this, you've got a blank customer name and a blank street, you'll get something that's kind of a little bit mysterious. You know string, empty string is too short, but what's too short, which one? And when you've got a really long, complicated JSON body, that actually can be quite difficult to work with. And there doesn't seem to be a way around that if you're using API Gateway. And so we went down the route of using Zod. Um, now, Zod's a TypeScript validation library. We're using TypeScript across all of our stacks, CDK and the Lambda code. Um, and so we're not using that native validation that's in API Gateway, which is a bit of a shame, but it's so we can, we can give a much better interface. And it's in our Lambda function. Um, and we can use uh, regular expressions, you can do custom messages, and you can do a lot. And if you're using Power Tools for AWS Lambda, they're using Zod as well, and using TypeScript. And so in the same example, now you'll get back street is required, for example, because we can set custom specific messages. It's a lot more useful to build against. And so the problem with this is, we assume that would be used for debugging. You know, they're getting this nice message back that's saying why it's failing validation but they actually ended up passing that string that comes back and displaying it in their user interface for their staff to see, which kind of logically makes sense for them because that means that the person entering this prescription will get back a nice message, but the problem is now the interface has been set and we can't change that. And again, this is why having that clear interface is actually really important, and in this case, we kind of got it wrong. We should have made it a bit more obvious. We shouldn't have just dumped it as a string. We should have maybe done a structured object maybe in the first few weeks. Now we also need to build a full customer facing website as part of this. So the patient needs to be able to log in, pay for their prescription, look at their order history, edit their address, that kind of thing. So again, we've not got long, so we want to keep it really simple. So we've got to use the technology that we've already got that expertise for. So off the shelf component libraries and templates and that kind of thing. And we just want to really stick to the basics. So we can use colors, you can change colors and so on, but we don't want to be doing like a specific custom design because that just takes a long time. We can always revisit that later. Now in this case, we used uh, React for our front end because we've got React experience elsewhere. We're using React Native for our um, native app as well. And we ended up using Chakra UI as our component library. And if you've ever seen Chakra UI or if you've not seen it, you can go on there and it'll have like message boxes and tables and you can kind of drop them React components in and you can build together, you know, like compose together this web page with a basic you know, lay out a logo at the top and you'll have a full website that works really well across different devices. Now, the other one is that we found that when we're going to get a prescription through from this third party, if it fails, we don't want that to go to a log file. You know, we want it to go to the operational staff, not the technical staff, because we're going to be getting like several hundred of these a day, thousands a day potentially at some point, and we don't want to be hunting through logs and so on. And so, what we ended up doing was using chatbot, which if you've never used chatbot, it's really easy to plug it in. So we, in our Lambda function code where we're doing our validation or maybe in other places where things fail, you can just pass an error in the right sort of structure to SNS, and SNS can send that into chatbot. And chatbot is easily configured to Slack and Teams and so on, and so we had that going to Slack. But I mean, the main issue is obviously eight weeks just really isn't very long to get this working. And so our team was a small team. We didn't want to do a big team on this. Like it's important that we can move fast, but we also need to have enough people to, to, to be able to work in parallel. So we, we just have this small specialized team of people who had their own different areas. And um, so we had four engineers in total working on this. There was one tester in there who was helping us test and get this through where we didn't have automation. And we had a product owner who sat in there as well and really just getting quick decisions in that squad so that we can get it moving. Uh, it's all about flow. And so that software development lifecycle, when we use this in our other, you know, across the board, it wasn't just for this project, but we're using this kind of lean agile process 
we're not. It's a Kanban style process, which means that it is literally about flow. Every single task is this kind of small, deployable task. We try and stick to say one day in length for each task, but we don't really um, enforce that. It's more just when you're doing your breakdown, think about it like that. And the important thing is that each of them tasks needs to be backwards compatible because it should be able to go to production. Now in this scenario, we're building something ready for a first launch, so it doesn't really need to go to production, but we've carried on this since and we use it in other teams. And the idea is that every single task is, is you can build it and on its own, it goes through code review, it'll go through any testing and it can go straight to production through our CI CD pipeline and you can just keep moving. What it does mean is that you'll end up having to think about your task breakdown a lot more. You might have to use um, configuration and kind of that kind of thing so that you can get a change out to live without breaking live. So new features have to be thought of in a slightly different way. And you know the key is automation when you're doing something this quick. And to keep our um, momentum going, we're still using high momentum. So I mentioned earlier how we put static code analysis in and code formatting on day one. Like, there's nothing worse to me than having a lot of developers who are quite expensive at the end of the day sitting there and doing what is basically linting, you know, failing a queue. It, because it's quite easy when you're doing a pull request to just pick out the easy stuff. And that's not where a manual code review should be doing. A manual code review should be looking at, is it correct? Is it following the correct principles? Does it actually do what the task says? Not does it look pretty, does it match the coding standards of the rest of the team? That doesn't matter as long as it works. And it's, it's all about not getting hung up on that simple stuff. Um, like one of the key things that I find of it is that you've got to focus on like the high value. Like good enough is, is actually really important because software is meant to be soft. Um, it's quite easy for people to get into this like engineering life cycle where they spend a lot of time trying to perfect something before it goes to production. It's fine to go to production in a state that isn't perfect as long as it works and you're going to fix it at some point. Like it's not building up tech debt, it's just being smart about the fact that you're constantly changing production so it doesn't matter. Um, like a, it's a healthy code base if it's constantly being refactored. It's healthy if it's evolving. And if you're doing unit tests, you're doing TDD, then even refactoring doesn't really have much, you know, you don't have much problem. And so a lot of times you'll have a developer working on something and if they start getting hung up on it, you can just say, it's fine, we'll raise a task to fix it in the, you know, in the future and we'll just prioritize it. And so we will get to it, we'll always get back to it. So like ultimately, obviously we did this earlier in the year, but like, is that project finished? Well. You know, it was ultimately just this MVP, but it's an MVP that went to production and we started on the first day we launched, we started to receive these prescriptions through and it's been really successful for the business and it's actually changed the business, this outlook when it comes to B2B, we're now hitting a different market because of this and it's really helped us grow. So the next steps, and this includes steps we've kind of already taken, but since we um, went live, because we're moving quickly, we needed to add payments. Well, we've already doing payments elsewhere. We've got a website, we've got a native app, we've got different places we take payments. But inside this application, we also needed to take payments. Now, we didn't want to sit and refactor our website so we've got a payments microservice so we can then use it in this. That doesn't really make sense. And so we built it inside the application and then we need to split that out later. And we just want to keep continue splitting out into these self-contained services as just this kind of domain-driven design strategy that we've been working on ever since. Uh, Power Tools Radio Radius Lambda, we, we added in that later, so we've got this clean structured login, but we actually do want to move like from doing just tracing and logging in that kind of traditional three pillars, we do want to move into like an event based observability, which is um, a lot easier for tracing and a lot more affordable if you do it right, um, and we can do that across all of our accounts in one single place. But yeah, thank you.